Well, completely changed my plans for what I was going to do tonight. Um, I had to have a tooth pulled this morning. And um, so you all are lucky that I'm here. Um, my um, dentist is a genius. Um, but last year, my, the anniversary of this event is tomorrow. I had to have a hip replacement on December 2nd. So this is my poem about that. Ode to my right hip. Contrary to public opinion, I am not an old hippie. I did, however, suffer from an old hip, that largest joint atop the longest human bone, the cartilage worn away, and the socket so filled with bone spurs that its x-ray resembled the crab nebula. In the operative report, my surgeon refers to me as a pleasant 62-year-old female. Pleasant? Heck! My constant grinding pain created an ongoing bad mood and the impulse to inflict equal pain on grocery store clerks and co-workers and anyone else in my way. I saw myself become a shrew, a harridan, a bitch and a half, so I succumbed to the surgeon's hammer and scalpel and sutures. Now I'm full of hardware, unerodible, dazzling titanium ball and shaft and three spiraling screws to stabilize my acetabulum. I am still a dangerous woman and carry a card with a warning that I'll set the metal detectors ringing, alarming airport security. But now my lion-headed cane is back in the umbrella stand among the other ornamental walking sticks, and I can walk without a limp upstairs across a stage and perhaps once more be taken for the dancer I never was. Um, okay. Whom I dislike. Mimes, clowns, and vampires share a repulsive and unnatural pallor, wear masks or makeup and make unsavory lifestyle choices. I have no use for them. Clowns and mimes find it difficult to communicate without bells and whistles and elaborate gestures while vampires are smooth talkers, seducing you with forked tongues in order to stick their fangs into your jugular. Vampires stay up all night doing unspeakable things. When you ask where they've been or what they've done, they'll respond, nowhere and nothing, then sleep the day away, disdaining meals and conversation. They remind me of my former husband. And I've known my share of clowns, those inappropriate jokers fond of smashing pies in your face for a birthday surprise or initiating embarrassing pratfalls. Mostly, I've been able to avoid those annoying mimes, except for Marcel Marceau, occasionally appearing on a television show, or sneak attacks in New Orleans or San Francisco. Give me rosy-cheeked, plain speakers who open their front doors in welcome, rather than some clown tooting his horn or mime pretending separation, pressing against an invisible wall, or pale, alluring vampire leading me on. This is a poem I wrote um, a few years ago. And um, I realize now that I've turned into the person I'm describing. Um, but this was a real person. Aunt Nelma. She's the kind of old lady of whom it is rumored she was once a great beauty. Sitting very straight in her corner, 
puffing an extra long cigarette, she presides over the party. What's the word for it? All these new things. Technology, someone suggests, but Aunt Nelma is deaf. I just don't know where I am anymore. I hope I die before I have to sell my house. She laughs at this and smooths the short pleated skirt over her knees. You know what they give me for Christmas? I take it out of the box, this big green shirt, and then there's these big green pants, and they say, that's a sweatsuit. What am I gonna do with a sweatsuit? I'm not one of those joggers. They say, wear it around the house. Well, I never. She pauses, surveying her audience. Does she want us to know she would never wear trousers, or are we to see her jaunty in her jogging suit? Charles likes that Harvey's Bristol Cream, you know. So I bought him a bottle and a box of candy for her and one for the nurse, Olga. And I call her and say, I've got these presents and can Olga come pick them up? Well, I never heard from her again. Charlie basks in Nelma's favor, but we're not so sure about her. I didn't want to walk over there and maybe fall with a bottle of wine. Mabel did that, you know, last year, and she still hasn't recovered. We imagine multiple lacerations. We suspect Mabel's drinking problem. Her back, you know, Nelma winks at her great nephew, then rises with the help of her cane and leaves us in the lurch in the suddenly empty living room. I'll read a, um, a new poem. Um, my parents died, my father died in 1981, and my mother died in 1994. And their ashes have been in my sister's closet, or were in my sister's closet for years. And we kept planning that we would go to Ocracoke, which is where we used to vacation. It's the Outer Banks of North Carolina and scattered their ashes, and it, found, it finally happened this summer. And I just recently read a novel, which I would recommend to you, which has a similar premise. Um, it's called That Old Cape Magic by Richard Russo, and um, he also ends up with his parents' ashes in the trunk of his car and has a really hard time getting them scattered. Um, but we've, we did it. And um, this poem uh, refers to a bird uh, which is the piping plover, which is a bird that looks like a killdeer, and like a killdeer, it um, lays its eggs in depressions in the sand on beaches or on lake shores, uh, where they are disguised by pebbles and fragments of shell, um, thinking that that will protect them. And um, one of my passions is bird watching, although we now call it birding. <laughs> and it is a competitive sport. Um, it's it's got, actually gotten kind of vicious. It used to be for little old ladies, but now it's for, you know, jocks. Like me. <laughs> Ogre Coke, August 2009. The piping plover lays its eggs where they lie, camouflaged by their resemblance to shell and beach debris, thinks that this disguise is their protection. If the nests are discovered, that stretch of beach is closed for the season, cordoning them off from careless feet, crushing tires, and probing paws. My sister and I reach the open beach, carry our parents' ashes in plastic bags, out of sight beyond the dunes, from sunbathers and beachcombers and frisbee-throwing dog owners. In the shade of waving sea oats, we wait for the surge of surf to cover our feet, then open the bags, letting ash and bits of bone commingle, becoming one with sand and fragments of shell mixed by the swirling water and finally invisible as plover's eggs awaiting breaking open and birth. 